Good morning. It's not yet time to start, but we will start in two minutes sharp. We have 90 minutes allotted and we will have to leave the room or stop at 10.40 because there's another session scheduled after us. So please take your seats and install yourselves. And those who don't intend to be in the room for the session may I ask you kindly to leave the premises and continue discussions outside. Thank you. Okay, let's get started. Uh, I'm Marcus Gummer. I have been the co-facilitator of this best practice forum on cybersecurity uh, together with uh, Ben Wallace. Ben Wallace, unfortunately, is not with us. He's in Dubai attending the ITU plenipotentiary, but he's connected with us and he will say a few words remotely from Dubai. Uh, good morning, Ben. Over to you. We can hear you, but it's rather faint. Can we make him a bit louder? I will get it twice if I can. Much better. Thank you. Uh, yes. Um, good morning, everyone. I'm um, I'm in the ITU Planning Potentiary Conference. Um, I'm sorry that I cannot join the session in person. Um, I look forward to following online over the next 90 minutes um, and, and producing a report at this session. I've been honored to be the MAG member co-facilitating this best practices forum this year with Marcus and supporting his important work in any way I can. And I'm looking forward to hearing views today on the draft output to which many of you have provided uh, valuable contributions. Just quickly before you get onto the discussion, um, I'm, I'm just gonna offer a quick report on discussions here at the IT, ITU Planet Potentiary Conference. In the ITU, cybersecurity is covered by resolution 130 on strengthening the role of ITU in building competence and security in the use of ICTs. And on the one hand, there is some positive news. There has been um, agreed um, a substantial amount of new and modified text which provides new work on cybersecurity issues for the ITU, including some targeted at uh, the ITU providing support for developing countries. However, there are two main areas of outstanding difference which are preventing adoption of the text. Firstly, there is a disagreement about whether to include a decision to update the ITU's Global Cybersecurity Agenda, GCA. And the other major block is disagreement about whether to resolve um, that the ITU should start or that there sh to resolve that to start with urgency the development of an international convention on securing cyberspace taking into account the work of the ITU sectors. Um, that, that's the wording that's being objected to by a number of parties and supported by others. And although the conference ends on Friday, um, in practical terms, agreement needs to be done tonight in order to allow enough time for translation and formal adoption of the text. Uh, at this point, there isn't any sign of how these issues will be resolved, and I expect um, negotiations to go late into the night. So I'll leave you with that news from uh, Dubai, and um, I, I'll let you get back to things, and I look forward to following the session. Thank you. Thank you, Ben, for that. And before the starting the discussion, let me start introducing the people here on the panel. Next to me is Kaya Ziglit from Microsoft, who will be the co-moderator of the session. And next to her is uh, Ethan Penyanito, who is from Article 19. And next to him is Jim Wegeseller, who is the 
Secretariat representative who has been holding the pen for the work so far, and to my left, uh, there is Salila Saludin from Facebook, and she will talk about the Tech Accord. And uh, next to her, on the program, you have Alexander Klimburg, but he was not able to make it. He had some family emergency, and he's replaced by Luke Fresen, also from the Global Commission on the Stability of Cyberspace. So these are the panelists. Before giving them the floor, allow me to say a few words on this session and the background. The best practice forums are sort of the pillar of the intersessional work, and this is not just a standalone workshop. It is the culmination of work that has been ongoing. In this particular case, it's the third year already of this best practice forum on cybersecurity. Before that, there were two best practice forums, one on unsolicited email. Thank you for pointing out. It seems I was not close enough to the microphone. Is that better? Yes. Uh, there were two, from two, 2014, there were two best practice forums uh, on uh, unsolicited email and on c -certs. And after two years, they folded up, they've done their work, but it was felt there was a, ne a necessity to continue uh, work on cybersecurity. And then this best practice forum on cybersecurity was started. It started with more definitional role on looking at the different roles of stakeholders. In the second year, it looked more at the contribution to the SDGs. And now, in the third year, we look at norms and values uh, in cyberspace. Uh, and Wim will introduce uh, the papers that are under discussion. We received contribution, and some of major contributors are represented here on the panel. Uh, the discussion here is conceived as a roundtable discussion, and it is supposed to flow into the final in output of this best practice forum. But we will also have to look at if there is room for future work. Should the work continue? Should the IGF deal with cybersecurity in another way? But in any case, it is a big issue. And uh, all of you know, here in Paris know there has been the Paris call. This is something uh, we may also wish to discuss and address. And maybe this may be a focal point for future work. And to conclude my introduction, just a few practicalities. Uh, we do have remote participation facilities and there have been some complaints that we have not given, paid enough attention to remote participation in the past. So I would call on those looking at the remote participation to alert us whenever there is a wish to take the floor. And there is a queuing system on the website. You see when you click on the website, you can put your name in the queue when you want to talk. And the idea was that we give, create a level playing field for those who want to participate remotely and those who are in the room. Because obviously, there's a natural tendency to give preference to people who are physically present in the room. So the queuing system should allow those coming in remotely come in at the same time whenever necessary. Uh, so with that, I will give the floor to Wim, who will introduce all the documents we have on the website, and then Kaya will take over and moderate the substantive discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Marcus, and uh, good morning uh, to all. Um, as Marcus said, I will briefly uh, give an overview of the work the BPF has been doing because I, I think it is very important to understand the BPF started working um, shortly after the, uh, the previous meeting of the IGF and brought different uh, specialists and different stakeholders together to discuss this topic on cybersecurity and specific on cybersecurity norms. Uh, there are two draft papers out. Um, draft specifically because they are uh, intended to be discussed at this meeting and only be published after the IGF meeting, taking into account the discussions here and taking into account other experience, other um, case studies and examples, so that they, both documents can be um, published as output of the IGF meeting. Now to the content. This year's BPF focused on norms. 
and a uh, culture of norms in cybersecurity. Why? Because there is the observation that the norms have become more important as a mechanism uh, in cybersecurity for state and non-state actors to agree on a responsible way um, to behave in cyberspace. Uh, why? Because it is the evolutions go very quickly and it is clear that um, the traditional way of uh, lawmaking or the traditional way of agreeing uh, often goes very slow uh, and very late to uh, take immediate action. Um, the document, the first document described how there have been alternative challenges uh, to create these norms, uh, but it immediately comes up with, uh, with the idea uh, that these norms, these alternative ways are often, um, are often developed in relatively close communities, in relatively close groups of different stakeholders uh, who, do not, who do not communicate with each other uh, who really focus on their own specialities and um, do not involve the others. Um, therefore, the BPF started with um, exploring the, uh, the field of the culture of norms and, uh, and values in, uh, in cybersecurity uh, with questions um, like what norms, what different types of norms are out there, uh, where in what groups, in what fora are they developed, um, and what lessons can be learned uh, if you look at the norms and how are they communicated, how are they, uh, how it's made clear that, uh, how is it made possible uh, that others follow the norm, that they are aware of them. Um, after looking for those practical examples, uh, the BPF took also I think a very important second track, and that was looking to the question, looking into the question of a possible cybersecurity digital divide. Uh, starting from the idea, is it possible or is it a reality that in some parts of the world or in some communities or even within communities and countries, some groups of people are just not aware of some, secu uh, some security norms or just not, just are not aware or not able to, to follow the norms? And that because of that, there uh, exists, a sp there, um, there is a kind of a security, guy, a security divide uh, or development divide within the communities. Um, roughly what I've said now is um, published in the first paper that was uh, developed with input from different stakeholders that looks in a more um, theoretic way to the, uh, to the issue looking for examples. The second part of the BPF's work is based on a call for contributions that went out to um, everybody in the community, a set of seven questions, um, basically also intended to test what a smaller group has had discussed, whether that fits with um, general opinions and uh, opinions of everyone. Uh, some of the very surprising or interesting uh, facts was that, for example, in the, um, if you ask the definition for the definition of cybersecurity norms, that there are um, a great number of definitions coming in, of responses coming in, that are in line with what um, probably the cybersecurity community uh, will think of uh, as norms in, in the fact of clear rules or clear guidelines uh, for states, for companies, and so on. Uh, but um, if you have that open call, they, we also saw a number of um, different angles coming in, different definitions coming in. For example, uh, people that focus on a culture of norms, a culture of uh, cybersecurity uh, within a specific organization, within um, a company, um, and put that next to, um, next to the more global or general norms we traditionally discuss. Um, a number of views also, um, different views came in um, uh, that, for example, people start talking about norms. Um, if you ask about norms that people started focusing on end user uh, behavior. Um, I think there was one uh, very well, one very interesting contribution coming from um, a school teacher um, from a, from a Euro European country that 
more um, interpreted the question of norms in terms of um, what kind of behavior uh, do you have to um, explain or do you have to um, what expect from end users? And came up, okay, if you talk about the norms of, for cybersecurity and you look really at the end, end user perspective, um, you can come up with very simple things uh, instead of in, uh, like uh, anti-malware uh, scanning, um, like the, the fact that you have to install updates. Uh, so that's a completely different perspective. I think most of the uh, initial uh, panelists were um, uh, were not immediately thinking of. Uh, the document also asked for examples of norms that uh, worked well. Uh, some participants uh, or some contributors uh, refer to existing uh, frameworks. One that came up was the uh, NIST framework from the United States. Um, and I mentioned it because it was also mentioned, not only the framework, but also mentioned as an inspiration for other countries. Uh, for example, Italy, that has its own framework uh, that copies or is inspired by the, uh, by the US example. In our call for contributions, contributions sorry, we also asked for concerns, concerns um, with regard to norms and norm in, um, implementation. Um, some contributors mentioned that uh, often norms have good ideas, uh, but the fact that norms are not implemented or not followed uh, has to do with the fact that they are defined way too broad, uh, that there is no clear uh, agreement on or no clear understanding of the, um, the exact details. Uh, so that, that is, the norm is there, everybody agrees, but nobody is doing anything with it. And some other contributors really flagged the fact that, um, as I mentioned in the beginning, often norms are developed within a specific stakeholder group or within an interstate environment, uh, and that it is very difficult to uh, turn it into a multi-stakeholder uh, environment. Well, uh, or others say that multi-stakeholder environment or multi-stakeholder support can be very crucial if you want the norm to be successful and implemented. Um, with regard to implementation, there were also a few um, contributors that pointed out that there is a need for a lot of uh, training and additional research on, first of all, to know what is out there already. Uh, and that, and probably that's the lesson everybody will agree, that the implementation of norms takes time. That it's not something that goes from today till tomor uh, on tomorrow, but it takes time. And to finish also in the um, last question in our call for contributions, uh, was specifically asking whether or not uh, people see a um, digital security divide. There, I think most of the, um, the contributors agreed that there are, uh, either there is of clearly is a risk um, to have uh, that kind of, uh, of divide between, uh, either between uh, developed, uh, less developed world, but worlds, uh, but also um, clearly between people that are just joining the internet, um, that are just moving to the internet, and people that are already longer online. Let's uh, say people that are longer online have in a way been trained and, and know better or try to know, know better from experience how to deal with some risks, how to deal with some, um, some security threats, while people that are now joining really have a steep learning curve and uh, need, to, uh, need to adapt to a, a lot of things. Uh, so that is um, a very high level overview of the contributions. As I said, uh, we all hope that this, discu this discussion today with the panel and the audience is very fruitful so that we can harvest a lot of additional ideas that go into the final call. Thank you. So he said I need to be close to it, right? So thank you, thank you, Wim. Um, so as um, Marcus mentioned at the beginning, this is supposed to be a roundtable discussion. We will sort of open with uh, sh really short remarks from each of our panelists uh, to sort of 
I think maybe highlight some of the, um, both some of the contributions, but some of the actually <coughs> exciting work that has happened, I would say, over the past two weeks in the norm development process, whether you look at the Geneva Dialogues in Switzerland, whether you look at the um, ASEAN commitment to implement the UNGG 2015 norms, um, whether you look at the UNGG process and the possible two parallel processes that will be going on to discuss norms the, in the United Nations system, or whether you look at the Paris call, I think there's, is this is clearly a space where a lot is going on, um, and, but um, like Wim mentioned, I think there is a perception that a lot is going on in either government to government conversation or industry to industry conversation and not so much in the multi-stakeholder space. I think with that sort of the Paris call is probably the one slight exception to it. Um, and with that, um, I wanna kinda hand it over to Luke to start with and to touch upon one of those things that I haven't mentioned when I was like, all oh, the exciting things that happened the last two weeks. Sure. Sorry for jumping in. One thing I forgot to say, that this best practice forum was not here to develop norms, but to look at norms that were developed elsewhere and to comment on that. Because there was some apprehension at one point that some people thought we were here to develop norms, but that was not the case. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, to talk about the work of the Global Commission on, on Stability in Cyberspace and the Singapore package. Thank you very much, Kaya. Uh, for the latecomers, let me introduce myself. My name is Luke Fassen. I uh, work for the Higgs Center for Strategic Studies, which also functions as the Secretariat of the Global Commission on the Stability of Cyberspace. Unfortunately, Alexander Klimberg, who was initially in the program, was not able to come. Uh, as his deputy, I will be talking, give a short introduction about the commission and uh, our work on norms of responsible behavior. Um, the GCSC, uh, the acronym for it, <laughs> it was uh, launched at the 2017 Munich Security Conference. Um, it is chaired by Marina Kallirond, the former foreign minister of Estonia, uh, as well as two co-chairs, uh, Michael Chertoff, uh, former DHS secretary from the US, as well as Lata Reddy, former deputy national security advisor of India. Uh, it brings together 25 uh, commissioners um, uh, in addition to the three chairs. They basically come from all different regions. Uh, so we have people from Beijing to uh, Chinese, Russia, Europeans, African, US commissioners. Um, they also represent a different community basically. Uh, the commission is very much focused on international peace and security. So our mandate is very much focused on developing proposals for norms and policy initiatives in this space to that increase international peace and security. So think about it in terms of like if you, within the UN system for example, it's the first committee, those kind of issues. Um, uh, the members, however, is all they act independently. So in addition to that, we also have people from the IGF community that uh, function as commissioners and as advisors. For example, Wolfgang Kleinwachter, Oriette Esterhuse, as well as uh, Vin Cerf. Um, the uh, idea of the commission is basically, well, maybe a little bit more about the organization itself. Um, it, you know, it also has a research advisory group. Um, so basically that uh, is mainly constituted by one email list, which people, and I encourage you all to sign up to, to basically give feedback on the work of the commission and also you know, develop any proposals or any ideas that you would like uh, for us to pick up as well. Um, now a little bit about the how, um, so and explaining why this commission was set up. Um, the reason or the raison d'etre behind the commission is very much focused on the discussions within on international peace and security within this field are very much done within the first committee uh, or they are uh, or regional organization for that matter. Uh, for example, the developments within the United UNGGE, as Kai already explained. Uh, what we see there though is that um, that discussion is very much only a, a discussion among states um, and also a small group of states. For example, the UNGGE only has 20 and then 25 members, uh, which are only governments. Um, what we saw or what we believe in uh, is that this discussion could actually benefit from the expertise, the knowledge, and also not only on the content, but also on the process 
from other communities, and especially the technical community and the internet governance community. So if we're talking about process, we're talking about multi-stakeholder processes that you know, reflect the actual state of this space, you know, in which civil society manages most of the internet, critical resources of it, and private sector develops most of the services and deals with most of the, you know, owns most of the critical infrastructure. So we feel that there is an added value of, you know, strongly believe that states should not only should actually take in that expertise and that knowledge from those other stakeholders when they are negotiating um, or and talking or discussing about international peace and security in cyberspace, um, which is always a bit tricky because in international peace and security, states have always been the predominant actor. Uh, if you look at, for example, previous arms control or uh, developments in technology, it's, you know, it's always the, the committee that is most difficult to port in other um, uh, expertise and other knowledge from other stakeholders. Um, the commission basically meets four times a year. We have two hearings, so last time that was in Singapore, uh, in which we invite you know, governments and also other outside experts also coming from uh, the technical community, internet governance community. We had Martin uh, van Horenbeek as well from the first community who was there to basically give feedback on the work of the commission and actually consult with us um, on, you know, uh, on, for example, the things that we are developing. And one of those things that came out of that meeting and which we um, also had discussed at the IGF on uh, two days ago was this Singapore norm package. Um, I just, I was asked to also give a little bit of explanation on um, why did we end up with these norms. So um, in addition to the first two norms that uh, the GCSC developed, which is on the protection of the public core of the internet, um, and the protection of electoral infrastructure, the Commission decided that uh, some of these, uh, some more norms are necessary. In that sense, it was basically a bottom to top down approach. So what we did is we start with norms. That was the first part of our mandate, so develop norm proposals. In that sense, it gives a good indication for many of our members to actually identify what is missing in the current um, let's just say ecosystem, but also in the current norms that have already been established elsewhere. And we're looking at, I mean, very much inspired by the, 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 the norms that have already been developed within the UN group of governmental experts and also in other fora as well. And what we thought is the commission has wanted to add on to that. And these norms that have been developed thus far basically are the lower hanging fruit and what we think is missing to uh, identify or to reach some kind of sense of stability in cyberspace. Um, so that you can basically sum them up in norms that are which we also submitted in the uh, in our submission for the uh, for the BPF is that we basically link it in terms of critical off and critical for cyberspace, and you can basically fill those up uh, like public core is very much at the core of the internet itself, and then you have for example the electoral infrastructure which is in the application much more, um, and then basically fill those up along the way, and you can put these norms basically on that spectrum. Um, in addition to that, um, I would say maybe also looking at the developments that you know we've seen here at the Paris Peace Forum and also within uh, the UN First Committee. Uh, so maybe take a step back on that. So what is the Commission's role or added value in uh, this kind of sense? Is that um, what we see is that, uh, for example, in the First Committee, there are now two count, you know two proposals that or two resolutions have actually gone through. So in addition to the US uh, UNGG um, resolution that has been passed, there's also a uh, Russian proposal which is about a open-ended working group. Uh, now the likelihood of, of course, it is very hard to determine it at this time already and you know what kind of success it will bring or not bring. The likelihood of you know two countering uh, uh, resolutions, I mean, the prospects for success in that is not that great. Um, so what we see in that sense, and also in addition to that, the, um, the uh, involvement or the language that is used in those things of involving other stakeholders. So not only states, but also involving non-state actors and civil society in those discussions was not as great as it was as we hoped. Um, so that's why we believe that you know, such a forum like this, but also like other initiatives and what we've seen with the Paris, you know, with the Paris call as well, that it doesn't only bring, you know, it was not only states that signed it, but it was a you know, large group of also civil society and uh, uh, companies that also signed on to it. And that's exactly, I think, the benefit of these kind of initiatives and also of the Global Commission to bring those 
uh, discussions of other stakeholders and especially like the technical community and internet governance community and inform those deliberations in the first committee. Um, maybe a little bit more about uh, the future of the commission and uh, up until now we are very much focused on developing norms. Uh, so in a, we have basically now a collection of eight norms. Um, in addition to that, it doesn't mean that, you know, the, 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 the focus of the commission will be focused much more away from norm development and much more towards implementation. Um, and also like basically the question of how, where should they be situated or where are they housed within the larger international peace and security architecture. And that is basically what the commission will be focusing on for the next year. Um, that doesn't mean that, uh, you know, with the small uh, asterisk here is that they might still develop one or two more additional norms uh, if, you know, they feel the need or the, because of, uh, you know, current developments that they feel the need is there for such a norm. Um, and moving forward, we look very, we very much look forward to engage with you and also to receive feedback on these norms that have been developed and also on your ideas to further implement, for further implementation of these norms or actually actualizing them much more sense. So please feel free to reach out to us um, either for your website or via email address and or to approach me afterwards as well. Thank you, Luke. Um, I think the, the other thing that to point out maybe around the, the, the norms package, this particular norms package is, you know, in, in traditional, traditionally you'd have norms developed for states yeah. in this space. And I think the, the, the Global Commission has sort of reached out a little bit more and sort of continued in the tradition to, of try, trying to find ways of putting forward norms that go beyond that and look at private sector entities as well. Um, so I think that that's kind of an interesting intersection. I think maybe if, I, if you could now talk a little bit about from your perspective, from Article uh, 19, on sort of what do you see about your contribution to the BFP, but also what do you see as critical issues in this space? Um, hi, my name is Ephraim Kenyanito. Um, Kenyanito being one word, so I'm spelling in the uh, transcript. Um, so our concern has been uh, looking at the uh, cyber security from a human rights perspective. Because in my part of the world, sometimes cyber security laws are used to sneak back in criminal defamation and other issues which are not about infrastructure, but about, about uh, uh, protecting someone's individual uh, reputation and, 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 other, and maybe also uh, trying to uh, protect public officials from scrutiny and criticism and from uh, independent journalists. So that has been uh, our our concern. For example, I'll give the example of Tanzania uh, or other parts of, uh, of the world where I work in. So for Article 19 Eastern Africa, we work from um, Eritrea to Madagascar uh, and other parts of uh, within uh, the Comesa region. And we've noticed a trend of legislation whereby these laws developed uh, which are not human rights friendly. They're supposed to target us to deal with cyber security issues, uh, but then they, you end up sneaking in other non-cyber security issues, such as prevention of uh, sharing of information over the internet that would uh, uh, be uh, used to, uh, to question public officials. For example, some countries would not want their official statistics questioned, uh, which maybe sometimes there's discrepancies about the official narrative from independent narrative, and I'll give the example of recently World Bank criticizing one of the countries that we work, we work in um, for the amendment to some of their laws and making it uh, illegal to question official statistics. So that concern is also at the international level, and this is being brought through cybersecurity laws. So our entry point to this conversation has been when you're coming up with cybersecurity laws or cybersecurity uh, legislation or norms or policies, it should be human rights friendly. It should not uh, infringe on free speech or independent journalism or bringing other non cybersecurity issues. Because for us, we approach cybersecurity from an infrastructure and not about the, uh, the uh, fake news or criminal defamation uh, issues. Uh, so that has been our concern whereby the, the drafting or the language, because cybersecurity is a field where very few people engage, other actors, uh, maybe the, the lack of interest or the lack of knowledge, so you just think it's a security conversation, but then in, in that you discover that uh, sometimes some 
uh, some things end up being sneaked in uh, into some of those uh, laws which uh, end up not being very friendly. Uh, and maybe just to, to, to give uh, maybe also a, a f a more example is uh, we um, were part of the Freedom Online Coalition uh, working group uh, on cyber security and uh, we, uh, we uh, there were these 13 norms on cyber security and human rights uh, which we reference as maybe a starting point and given Freedom Online Coalition is a coalition uh, that uh, is uh, um, well recognized and has developed uh, uh, interesting practices all over. Uh, this is maybe the norms that we would, we would um, maybe we start as a good starting point of conversations when you're having these conversations with various stakeholders. And then also um, something else that we would maybe advocate and we've been trying to advocate is opening up of these conversations to be multi-stakeholder and not just to be single stakeholders because in my part of the world, um, we have uh, some of these policy making processes are close to the public or close, not open to scrutiny. Uh, so sometimes uh, you'll have a conversation with someone from Europe or from the US or from, uh, and they'll ask you, when is this law expected to happen? When is this going expected to, like some, some of these processes are unpredictable because they are not open to scrutiny. You have to really like put your foot in uh, much further than uh, other parts of the world. So uh, it's just, uh, that's what we would emphasize that more multi-stakeholder and more human rights friendly, especially not curtailing uh, the rights of independent journalists and uh, of not just independent, but just journalists and, and, and investigative work and then also cybersecurity research. Uh, sometimes uh, it is criminalized to do cybersecurity research, which uh, is, not helpful to the public and not helpful even to some of those um, institutions themselves or those governments. So trying to find a more multi-stakeholder way to uh, work in the space both in uh, cybersecurity research and, and, and not to uh, sneak in criminal defamation and other uh, content related issues on cybersecurity uh, laws. Uh, I think content related issues should be uh, legislated in specific in different laws not not on cyber security cyber security laws sh and norms uh, should be about infrastructure and should be human rights friendly and and, and um, should allow for human rights impact assessments among other uh, among other uh, mechanisms i think that's how i would open this conversation thank you and i think that we'll probably have like wide agreement on that on the panel um, but and uh, i think that sort of highlights <coughs> some of the challenges that we've seen at an international level as well, right? Because the two different approaches when you come to a global discussion around what norms could we agree on and what, how do you implement norms, sort of that's kind of the, 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 the controversial issue with the two different approaches. And I think on with that, I'll go to Salila to talk, to sort of provide an industry perspective and talk a little bit about sort of some of the industry initiatives in this space, but also to highlight um, the, the Paris uh, call that was launched earlier this week, which uh, I think both Facebook and Microsoft supported. First of all, thank you everyone for being here. It's an honor for me to be here um, among this distinguished panel. Uh, as you can tell, I'm recovering from losing my voice. I, I literally have not been speaking for the past 48 hours so that I could talk to you today. Um, so please bear with me. Um, as Kaya said, Facebook is a very proud member of the Tech Accord. Uh, as some of you may know, the Tech Accord is a public commitment among more than 60 global companies to protect and empower civilians online and improve the stability, security, and resilience of cyberspace. Um, as you heard from our panelists today, norms are really tough because you do have different stakeholders and you do have different interests. And I think the Tech Accord is phenomenal because when you say the tech sector, that encompasses so many different equities. And I'm just gonna name a couple of the uh, more recognized, if you will, names of Tech Accord members. Microsoft, which is a wonderful leader, and I'd like to single out Kaya for her amazing leadership in driving uh, many of the uh, Tech Accord engage engagements across companies. Uh, Facebook, certainly, Cisco, Cloudflare, Oracle, Panasonic, Telefonica, WiseKey, 
FireEye. So what we have there, we have a massive social media company, Facebook. We have a massive software developer, Microsoft. Uh, we have uh, cybersecurity researchers, FireEye. These are all companies with different interests, but we're joined together. And what are the norms that bind us? They are four, they are simple, they they're straightforward, and I'd like to share them with you today. Um, and what I'd like to single out as you listen to these norms is that they really apply to all of us. And we are able to come together despite our uh, breadth of uh, engagements around the world with our business enterprises because they apply to all of us and they make our businesses more effective and more secure and they make our users trust us and want to use our services, which really goes to um, the integrity of the internet within the developed world and also the integrity of the internet and the security of cyberspace for those who are joining uh, that community now. Number one, we will protect all of our users and customers everywhere. Number two, we will oppose cyber attacks on innocent citizens and enterprises from anywhere. Number three, we will help empower users, customers, and developers to strengthen cybersecurity protection. Number four, we will protect each other with like-minded groups to enhance cybersecurity. So those are very high level, but it's profound because it has brought many large and also small companies together under a common umbrella to be united. And I'd like to highlight uh, some of the work that we've done collaboratively uh, since our founding um, that really goes to the good impact that we're having already and that we hope to continue to have. Uh, as I said, we're more than 60 now. We hope to continue to grow um, uh, and share our values and uh, implement our goals uh, with more partners who share those. Uh, I'd like to point out the Manners Initiative. The Tech Accord supports the mutually agreed norms for routing security. This was an initiative that was launched by the Internet Society to increase the security of the routing system and finding technology solutions that would reduce uh, hacking and other risks. Microsoft is a leader there, is joined by KPN and BP, and I'm proud to say that Facebook is also uh, a member with our network security representatives uh, to promote uh, a safer cloud-based environment. Uh, we are also uh, big supporters of coordinated vulnerability disclosure. Um, this encourages industry practices um, that are fixed in terms of policy and practice. And for example, uh, since August 2018 alone, uh, we have seven additional members to the Tech Accord who have already developed, posted, <coughs> and are implementing policies and procedures that are about uh, coordinating the uh, identification uh, and information sharing of vulnerabilities. And that goes to protecting cyberspace beyond just the confines of a single company. Because there is access to information that we have that once leveraged across our network goes to not only um, securing us individually, but also more broadly. And because of the breadth of our users, that really impacts the globe. And I can't underemphasize the importance of that. Um, and then uh, to speak to the desire to sort of share knowledge and training uh, globally, uh, regardless of whether uh, people are members of the Tech Accord, we also have an ongoing webinar program. And these are really focused not so much on very high level cerebral norms, but rather technical education and training. Uh, we have had one hour deep dives uh, through these uh, webinars that are ongoing and continuing on uh, very technical subjects as cybersecurity in the cloud, hardware and cybersecurity there, as well as encryption. <coughs> and we hope to continue that and deepen those uh, in an effort to make sure that our outreach is not just focused on our membership, but globally. One thing that the Tech Accord really is looking forward to as we continue to grow and advance is being part of the multi-stakeholder uh, collaboration that has been addressed by uh, my fellow panelists here today. It's really important, as has been said here, to have private sector and civil society at the table with governments. And 
when we talk about discussing and in implementing initiatives, when we talk about respecting norms, to sort of bring those equities to the table uh, is essential. And that is actually a perfect segue to the Paris call for trust and security in cyberspace. I think it is very significant that President Macron was here at the Internet Governance Forum uh, to make the announcement of this. I think it speaks to the world that he's trying uh, to uh, communicate this with. And Microsoft did play a leadership role um, in this, and for that we are grateful. Facebook also, um, in behind the scenes, uh, talks and development, as Kaya will attest, uh, was also a part of that uh, conversation. And the goal here, uh, if I might recap uh, with the Paris call for trust and security, is to prevent and better recover from malicious cyber activities, protect the availability and integrity of the internet, cooperate to prevent malign interferences in electoral processes, i.e. protecting democracy uh, around the world, which is important, and work together against ICT-enabled theft of an intellectual property. That's something that certainly matters to um, a lot of companies around the world. Prevent the proliferation of malicious tools and techniques. Increase the security of ICT products and services and cyber hygiene, which goes to the individual cybersecurity of a user. And take steps to prevent hackback. And, important to this audience here, work together to strengthen the relevant international norms. Uh, I was very privileged to attend a talk that Brad Smith and others uh, gave the evening uh, of the tech, uh, excuse me, Paris Call's announcement. And I want to highlight some points that were made there and who, who the people were who were making those points because it goes to the desire for multi-stakeholderism among certain members of government and a sort of international bodies as well as the private sector. We had an emphasis on multilateralism being important uh, within the G7 as well as beyond. We had the importance of the private sector taking responsibility for uh, its role and, and the collaboration that is needed with other stakeholders. We had an emphasis on the security across the life cycle of a product. We talk a lot in cybersecurity about security by design, and that is certainly something that I think is and should be enshrined in a lot of these norms that we are seeking to develop and implement. And importantly, the Paris Call is about affirming norms. It is in many ways an international declaration and about the world's democracies coming together to sort of support a unified vision of what uh, the internet and of what cyberspace should be uh, after I think a very uh, wild, wild west period of development over the past uh, 20 plus years. Um, and so what the goal is of the Paris Call more than anything is to, in a very disciplined, responsible, engaged, and collaborative way, bring together government, civil society, NGOs, private sector, businesses, and others to build a movement to create a framework that we can respect uh, within the bounds of the law and within the bounds of what is right for the real world and, and right for the world of cyberspace. Thank you. Thank you, Salila. Um, um, I think uh, with that, I, I hope we've gotten a good overview of both sort of what, um, what is in the actual paper or draft paper that the group pulled together, as well as sort of a perspective from a, the Global Commission, sort of a multi-stakeholder initiative, um, Facebook, the private industry, and Article 19, which is one of the representatives of the civil society that engaged in this work. And with that, I would like in, like to see whether there's questions in the room. Um, Vlada uh, volunteered, so maybe Vlada, you start with the first question. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Kai, and thank you for, for all of you for, put it, for putting up uh, such a great uh, product. Uh, Vladimir Duvich from Diplo Foundation, but maybe wearing the, <coughs> the head of the advisory board of the Global Forum of Cyber Expertise. Uh, and it is sort of an apology that the GFC has not contributed more extensively to the work of the Best Practice Forum, and I can promise that we are going to do that next time. But I think it's relevant to also mention the efforts of the Global Forum on Cyber Expertise, which many of you and uh, <coughs> in the room support heavily uh, when it comes to um, particular work on helping the countries 
to work on their national strategies, uh, to map what are the available capacity building programs, awareness raising campaigns, uh, to enhance the uh, implementation of various standards and so on. So to that extent, I just wanted to simply to note the work of the Global Forum on Cyber Expertise and, uh, and uh, to, to promise that we'll, we'll try to contribute more uh, next year. Thank you. May I quickly jump in and for the transcription, that was Vladimir Radunovic who was talking, not just an audience member, he's a well-known member of the community. Uh, my point was more organizational. We have roughly half an hour for a freewheeling discussion before we have to wrap up. And I would like to invite you comment on what you heard and what you've read on the work of the best practice forum, but maybe also give your thoughts on the way forward for the IGF, what the IGF could or should do next uh, in the field of cybersecurity. We will not have much time to separate the discussion, so if you, in your comments, can also address the way forward issue. Thank you. Sure, and maybe we start with uh, the online participation. So no. Okay. So, <laughs> are there others in the room that want to? Yeah. And if you could introduce yourself. Hi, she's Hill Kumar from Global Partners Digital. Uh, my question is about the processes that you identified, the GGE and Open Ended Working Group, which are clear opportunities to input into high-level processes. And I was wondering if the BPF has a strategy or is thinking about a strategy to input into those processes that could emphasize the multi-stakeholder approach? Maybe I'll take a couple questions before we answer them. Yeah, go ahead. Hi, I'm, I'm Hans Klein from Georgia Tech. <clears throat> maybe it's a little related to the previous question, but may, maybe it's a little more academic. So the speaker on the right, whose name, I'm sorry, I didn't, I didn't quite catch, but I liked your, your analysis was excellent. You said so far we're looking at norm design. In the future, there's norm implementation, but in the near, near term, there's an intermediate step, which I would call norm authorization which is looking at authoritative institutions, the international architecture, as you said, and possibly uh, locating some of these norms or proposed norms and attaching to, to authorization authority, which would then lead to implementation. So I'm quite interested in this near-term phase, uh, looking at the international architecture, uh, identifying different kinds of authority. There's state authority, there's multi-stakeholder authority, there's industrial co uh, collaboration authority, and so on. Uh, so what kinds of authority are out there, and uh, particularly non-state authority is really the most interesting one. What opportunities are there, aside from a state authorization of norms, for other forms of, uh, of, author of authority? Thank you. Uh, is there another question? So we have three. No. So then, uh, are, are there people on the panel who I have used, but um, do, do our co-panelists have views to answer this question? Um, so maybe addressing that question first, um, I very much take your point on like the authorization of it and linking it to like, we very much first look at, you know, what have other organizations and institutions done? And we very much like go beyond that. And so it's not only the GGE, it's also like uh, the manners from ISOC, which are very important, the norms are developed by Microsoft. I think that's exactly what we'll be doing in the next year is actually looking at like, okay, who are the relevant parties actually that you know, should be involved in implementation, but also like looking afterwards and you know, making sure that everything is adhered to. Um, for example, with the public tour, we're very much engaged like, you know, with, with the IGF and with, you know, with ICANN and other organizations in trying to like, you know, they're the, 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 the core majors basically of that norm, uh, protecting them. Uh, not these organizations, but also things that they protect, uh, that they handle. Um, we have also for the public core norm, um, you know, it's, we are also very happy that it's in the Paris call, just like four of our other norms that are in this package, uh, which are in that Paris call for uh, the, in the charter. So th that way, it's also like it's being supported by many other, you know, 300 plus organizations, including states and, um, and uh, private sector and civil society. And in addition to that, we have also, for example, with the public war norm, as an example again, uh, we have seen that um, within the European Parliament, it has been also added in a resolution or an amendment for a resolution as well to become a law. Uh, of course, it has to get approved through the EU process, so it's still the Council that needs to decide upon it as well. So there's just a couple of examples in how we're trying to push forward for implementation. Um, uh, and maybe also from within the UNGGE or like the, those developments, 
I think there will be, you know, we're very much open to engage what, you know, I echo what our chair said during our session on Monday is that very much open to engage with uh, both parties or with, you know, both, you know, outcomes of the resolution basically in trying to facilitate that kind of multi-stakeholder engagement with the Net Force Committee. Like we said, we're kind of disappointed in that it's not no stronger language in that or no uh, formal mechanisms yet in trying to port in that kind of, uh, that, you know, consultation from those other stakeholders. We're very much open to continue that discussion and I think maybe within the U.S. proposal via the regional organizations there could be such a window in which you could actually have that input from on-state stakeholders actually. Yeah, and maybe to echo that to, to, to your question, I think it's not the, you know, whether the best practice forum should engage, though we, that is something we should discuss. I, I think at, at the, at it's actually, the, it's very difficult to engage for non-government actors and I think the, that, that, that has been a disappointment. I think to your point around authorization, I think I, I, I almost don't think you can like pull them apart. You know, the, the implementation and authorization, I, I think this will sort of almost emerge side by side and whether it's a naming and shaming where I feel state, when, when people do not comply with the norms and where civil society, private actors, other governments call up sort of call out malicious behavior and it reinforces the norm and that's sort of how they become accepted over time is, is probably the most likely outcome. I think we just need to really all be engaged, yeah? Also, these are excellent questions and from an institutional point, uh, the weakness of this best practice forum is it doesn't have a multi-year mandate. It gets renewed from year to year. So this year we decided to focus on norms values and next year, whether or not we got renewed, we don't know yet, but it is definitely something that has been discussed in the IGF context, that, and there are proposals on the table to develop multi-year programs and multi-year strategies which would be, allow the IGF to be more strategic. But these are issues, especially implementation, I could imagine could be an issue for the BPF to discuss on the way forward. Authorization, I don't think the IGF would have the remit to do that, but it could maybe recommend authorization of any of these uh, proposed norms like the Paris call. But the implementation issue, I could imagine very well an issue to be discussed in a BPF. What does this norm mean actually when you translate it into action and then have examples? I don't think the BPF will be well established to develop legal language as such, but it could develop a narrative. What do we mean with this norm? What should be done? What should not be done? To essentially to illustrate a bit what could be done going forward. Thank you. C can I ask a follow, uh, just a follow on clarification on this? Okay. Um, the future of the IGF, in some ways the IV IGF seems to be the an opportunity, uh, an institution that may face an opportunity as, wow, that's kind of a, it's kind of UN related, it's multi-stakeholder, it's not ICANN. So if Vint Cerf is the father of, uh, of, of the internet, uh, Mr. Kummer, I think you're the father of the IGF. What do you see, can you speculate freely about the future of the IGF? Well, well, thank you for the compliment. I take it as a compliment. I would actually not accept it lightly. I mean, there are others with me. I mean, it's a collective endeavor, but I was involved in the IGF from the beginning. That is a fact. Well, I do think this is a great opportunity for the IGF. We had a high level participation at the opening with the Secretary General of the UN for the first time. He actually was here at the opening. It is his forum. It was the mandate was given to the Secretary General. He convenes the IGF and he was here and he encouraged the IGF to, to work, to improve and whatever, to be stronger. And with President Macron and with his Paris call, I think this is in a way an opportunity handed to the IGF on a silver tablet to take it up and to work with all the signatories of the Paris call on future implementation as a possible option forward. And also, as you know, the IGF has always been starved of resources. It has a very minuscule secretariat and all the proposals made for improving the IGF, they're not resource neutral. And if industry believes the IGF uh, should be a good, and I look to 
ver uh, to representatives of very important uh, uh, industry companies if they think the IGF could be a venue for developing this further. So I think they should also put the money where their mouth is. Uh, let's put it that way. There is clearly a call for more norms, maybe also for more regulation. Now, the question is, how do we want to develop that? Do we want to develop in a multi-stakeholder setting? And as you rightly said, the IGF has the credibility of the link to the United Nations, to the UN Secretary General. The UN has convening power. It is seen as a neutral platform. But at the same time, the IGF is not a hostile environment. It allows all stakeholders to come together as equals which may be, in a way, its weakness, as some don't like that very much, but on the other hand, it's also its strength. You are free to exchange opinions without any fear of what you say today may be held against you tomorrow. So my appeal to industry would be also make use of this platform you have. If the IGF fails, then the discussions will go elsewhere and the environment may not be as friendly. as. Ben said in his introductory comments, in Dubai there are negotiations on, on the way on whether or not the ITU should develop a comprehensive treaty on cyber security. If the ITU gets that mandate, that will definitely not to be as open an environment to non-governmental stakeholders as the IGF is to develop these uh, norms further in a multi-stakeholder setting. These are my comments. Thank you. Are there other remarks in the room? I, th I would think particularly uh, we kind of talked about the way forward and it would be interesting to hear whether people in the room or even on the panel uh, think that the, the best practice form of cybersecurity should continue work in this space, uh, whether there are um, other topics in this area that could be interesting for us to tackle. Um, you know, implementation implementation was of norms was one of them that was raised, but you know, cybersecurity is a very broad area of things. So, are there other suggestions and comments in the room? Alternatively, alternatively, if you um, you know, if you look at the paper itself, are there? Um, I think one of the questions I had for Ifran earlier was, how do you make sure that you know, the norms that are reflected, the norms that, that we worked on in the, are not just really driven by the West, I will say, but, but preserve some of the um, interest of other stakeholders of the Global South whilst calling for human rights. Yes, thank you, thank you Kaya. Um, just um, on that, uh, how do you bring on board other stakeholders? Uh, as uh, you have probably um, are aware, uh, the, this process requires, of course, a lot of capacity building, be it reso uh, both resources and, and also both financial and human resource, uh, whereby uh, the building of capacity of experts, this is something which uh, partnerships, um, more partnerships need to be developed um, to, to, to uh, build capacity for you to have more understanding and more uh, uh, input from those uh, stakeholders who are at the ground may be studying this, but maybe they're not linked to the global processes on, on, on this matter. And then also, uh, just also the, the financial and, and, and the, uh, and the uh, human resource. So basically also uh, getting maybe the experts to also be more involved at, the, at, the, at various uh, regional and at the ground level rather than very high level. So that's something which... Uh, should be more worked on more. There's already ongoing initiatives maybe with the ITU or with the African Union or with the European Union, but we need more um, more of those initiatives beyond just states because some of those initiatives, for example, between 2008 and 2013, when before the African Union came up with the African Union Convention on Cyber Security and Personal Data Protection, uh, that there was a lot of capacity building or work around that and coming up with Model laws on cyber law, on model cyber laws and data protection and electronic commerce laws across uh, sub-Saharan Africa, uh, but that work worked only with 
the uh, government officials and, and security officials, and maybe sometimes they didn't have the capacity to be fully engaged on some of these conversations, and these conversations maybe were closed door. And uh, when the first draft came out in January 2014, uh, it did, the first draft was not human rights friendly as it was, so uh, there was opposition, of course, around that first draft, and the African Union and, and the other stakeholders went back and redrafted it and came up with a second version in June 2014 in Malabo, Equatorial Guinea, and the second version was much better after public input. So if you don't involve the public and you don't involve stakeholders right from the beginning, you come up with drafts or with norms which are not uh, human rights friendly, they don't focus on the user, they are focused on, uh, hey, I'm President X, I don't want my term limit to be challenged. I would want to uh, keep being president for life or my, my son to become president next or my daughter. So I don't want um, anyone using this cyber cyber things to challenge my my authority. So that's the kind of laws that come up later if you don't involve the public. So I keep insisting multi-stakeholder and more capacity building beyond just uh, states and um, because this is for the, for the betterment of the whole ecosystem. So if you involve everyone right from the beginning, the ecosystem is much better uh, for everyone, not just uh, for you yourself as President X or as uh, as this person. Yeah, thank you. Are there any immediate reactions on, on the on the room? Are there any? I, I, you know, I feel that we have the unique opportunities to be able to gather input from the floor, um, rather than just hear from us. I mean, we can keep talking, but uh, it'd be good to hear from people in the room as well in terms of, you know, the value of the best practice forum, in terms of cybersecurity as a focal point, any views. Suggestions. Can I chime in? I'm sorry, I'm from the panel and not yeah. from the floor. Um, I just want to pick up on something uh, that was just said in terms of collaboration. And I've been thinking about this a lot in terms of some of the uh, professional work assignments I'm focused on right now around the world. But one thing that I don't think is really um, involved right now in our collaboration conversation is the role of the media in highlighting what is happening under the guise of cybersecurity around the world to sus suppress speech, to control content. And there are geographies where the media does not have that power. That power is silenced by the government. And I think that there is a role for global media to shed light, because when you shed that light, governments take notice around the world, companies take notice around the world, uh, activists and others take notice around the world. And I think that as we all contemplate how we collaborate and with whom we collaborate, the role of the media is really important. And I'm going to append that by saying it's a responsible media that I am thinking about right now, not a media that will exploit narratives that are being uh, spread to sow discord and division in democracies, but rather a responsible, invested, and engaged media that is really uh, focused on, on shedding light on some of these uh, exploitations of cybersecurity norms to advance agendas that suppress people. Um, and I, I just really wanted to make that comment and, and echo what was said yeah, by my I fellow panelists. Yeah, I think that's a critical point. I think, you know, in, in both in terms of the role of the media, but also the role of, of to your point, is the role of capacity building and ensuring that, and Lada's point, I guess, and ensuring that there are, uh, that both the journalists, the activists, and as well policymakers around the world actually know and are able to discuss cybersecurity best practices in terms of infrastructure and not just immediately go to sort of how do we regulate content. And I, I hear that there are the people online who have questions. So this is from Armour El Sadar. Several good examples of areas where security, stability, and resilience of cyberspace have been mentioned. However, protection against the theft of intellectual property is something that concerns me not because I believe this to be an illegitimate issue, but because parties seeking this protection of IP 
and trademarks online often have no incentive to balance the measures taken in furthering their goals against other legitimate interests such as freedom of expression, privacy, and data protection. And could someone on this panel address this? On the, anyone on the panel looking at how we balance freedom of expression, data protections, and IP law? Um, yes, so uh, as just to go back into uh, that conversation and maybe to reiterate, uh, we would want cybersecurity laws uh, to respect human rights generally uh, and, and to be about infrastructure and not about uh, content because IP laws you can amend the copyright laws which are already there. For example, Kenya is in the process of right now amending the copyright law to reflect the digital age. Um, data protection laws, it's a different legal regime from a legal standpoint. It's a data protection acts are different from cyber security acts or electronic transactions act. So cyber security is about infrastructure. Data protection is about content. Electronic transaction is about also mixture of both content and infrastructure. So from a legal standpoint. So uh, when it comes to copyright, copyright and intellectual property and maybe trademark, those are different regimes. You can amend the existing, because all these laws, the ban convention has been there. Uh, there's WIPO, uh, different treaties. There's, uh, there's ARIPO, African Regional Int Intellectual Property Organization, and other different regional organizations which have already dealt with this matter. So given we are already in a digital age, we shouldn't like reinvent the wheel and, and, and disregard all this work that has been done since the, the 19th century, uh, all these different conventions which have been there on intellectual property and, and, uh, and other uh, legal regimes. We should just amend what is there and not um, use cybersecurity as, the, um, as a sneak point to bring in new uh, legally restrictive mechanisms. So uh, that's, that's what I would just emphasize on that, that uh, we should not reinvent the wheel. There's already conventions or laws that our governments have passed. We just need to amend them and make sure that they're human rights friendly. As I mentioned, the Kenyan example of amendment to the Copyright Act or South Africa amending its similar provision uh, and instead of bringing this through the cyber security law because the moment you convolute infrastructure and content, you miss the point from a legal standpoint because even you go to court, it becomes unconstitutional. I'll give the example of the Supreme Court ruling of Philippines in 2015, where uh, some took uh, some various clauses were ruled unconstitutional because of similar convolution of issues. So, uh, for me, I would go back from my legal uh, background that some of these issues going back to court, we we, we would be found by some uh, judges or from from a legal standpoint to be. Uh, unconstitutional and would infringe on other rights if you convolute the issue. So it's about infrastructure and not about about uh, not about uh, the, the the content. So that's that's why we would we would, um, we would uh, insist that uh, if you convolute the issues and, and just that question is a good one, but let's not reinvent the wheel. Um, and that will really be helpful if if we we uh, just learn from what is what is already there and yeah. not yeah. I think the other thing to mention is also at the in a lot of the references in the international level to IP theft. I think it's less about copyright, but it's more about what we've seen in the last few. I think maybe not the last couple of years that much, but like five years ago, where there was a massive, um, um, basically, a hacking, um, sometimes sponsored by states, uh, to steal intellectual property of companies. So it was less about copyright; it was more about how do you, you know, how do you get designs for particular machines and um, sort of get them to other countries? I think there was another question on that. Yes. Um, oh, uh, sorry. He has a yeah. follow-up. Just, just uh, to follow up, uh, Kasia, <laughs> thank you for for that. Uh, and um, it's it's a it's a it's a trend that. Um, Microsoft and Facebook that maybe you've noticed in other partners in the industry. Uh, but uh, maybe my suggestion or maybe a best practice suggestion would be maybe to amend the ban convention or the various WIPO treaties that are already there on, 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 on this issue rather than uh, introducing this through cybersecurity laws or data protection and others uh, because 
that would be a much maybe adding an amend, um, amendments to this country. I know it's a very difficult legal journey to to to, to be or international. Yeah, and, and uh, I would law, I, yeah. I would generally I would agree with you. I don't think content and um, uh, that should be banned. I was just adding the perspective. I agree with you. But yes, another question. Can we say that IGF is designed in a way where more of debate portion takes place and ITU is the place where the actually policy making is done? If yes, how can how can this be changed so that IGF recommendations are better translated in state and global policies? Um, do people, I have, a, again, I, have an, I always have an opinion, but do, do people on the panel have views? Other I can, so I would say it's I, not necessarily, I think it's, I, uh, it's in, for in cybersecurity, I, ITU is, I think, still largely focused on capacity building um, there is not so much focused on driving actual mm -hmm. regulation. I think in the telecom space, that's obviously much more the case. But when it comes to cyber, I think so far, they've not like really went into that direction, gone into that direction yet, which um, I think is probably a good thing because we do want to have a multi-stakeholder debate around all of these things that we all have been saying. And gentlemen, the end of the room. Yes, uh, my name is Wesley Gibbings from the Association of Caribbean Media Workers and also the International Freedom of Expression Exchange. And this is in response to the concern about media engagement um, on this issue of cybersecurity. I think you will find that all the major organizations concerned about media development and the protection of press freedom are very much concerned about the issue of cybersecurity. In fact, there are hands-on um, training uh, modules that are being developed for journalists throughout the world to understand the issue better and also to understand that as media, we are both subjects and objects when it comes to the issue of cybersecurity. Uh, one of the problems that has emerged is the relationship dynamics between media and other stakeholders. Because I think sometimes there's the mistaken impression um, that media workers, media practitioners, can provide the service of, a, of an uncritical conduit for the flow of information between and among the various stakeholders. And that has not always been the case. There's no guarantee that journalists are not going to be um, critical, that are not going to investigate the details of it, and are not going to see self-interest as being part of the work that they do in this particular area. Thank you for that intervention. Uh, uh, South Korea IGF with Chang, Chang Choi. I just want uh, to uh, put a several point. Uh, first of all, uh, yesterday uh, President Macron argued that uh, we need a mo much more new rule, global service theory landscape and recurring uh, regulation and legislation, how do you think that how, I just want to hear opinion about the B, uh, BPF about that. And then secondly, uh, is she, I, I'm come from Korea IGF and then not just me, there's uh, so many uh, IGF all over the world and then I found that every, each country has a workshops every year and then it definitely has a uh, uh, workshops in a, their own local country about the service security. And then why don't you be uh, best pressed to put on, try to reflect that kind of the, uh, ideas and then report over each country, which is supposed to be published at the end of this year. And then uh, you can some take a uh, hold of the ideas from the all over the world about the strike balance, security, and freedom, and then data protection. That's my suggestion. That's all. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, the, 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 any comments on the question, the, the Macron's call on um, on regulation? Yeah, he did. Wait, let me take the second question. Oh, the second question. Go ahead. Um, I, I'm, I, I hear you. I think that that uh, notion of conversations being had all over the place in, in fora, then in countries, then within businesses. Um, and, and where do you go w with all of that? And I, I, I want to sort of return to the tech accord um, as something that is an example of marrying those conversations with actual action. 
Um, and the fact that we have grown to be more than 60 global companies around the world, I think shows a desire to start putting things into action. Um, and I think that, yes, there's, there's certainly um, frustration among certain stakeholders that uh, might not feel that a lot of action is being had, but I, I, I just want to emphasize that there is action actually being taken um, in a leadership role and in a collaborative way um, by the Tech Accord on many of these norms uh, that fit under the four broad umbrellas that I discussed earlier. And I think what's significant is that th these actions are taking place across the entire spectrum of cybersecurity uh, from a policy side, from a technical side, and otherwise. So uh, that, that uh, concern is heard, and I think that uh, there are broad global initiatives already underway, such as the Tech Accord, to address that. Yeah, and I will, uh, and I will sort of add one thing and then answer your question, and then maybe do like call an Ephraim and then start seeing whether we are moving towards conclusion. Um, I think uh, in addition to the webinars of the Tech Accord, I think the, the work of the Global Forum for Cybersecurity Expertise that was referenced earlier is also an, a very good example of how do you share best practices and how do you bring different stakeholders together. Um, I think I would, you know, it's uh, at your point that every country does workshops. I think it's hard to follow uh, globally what each country does. But uh, we would encourage everyone to sort of contribute to the Global Forum for Cybersecurity Expertise. And yeah, Ephraim's gonna go next. And then the, uh, the, on your question on, I think Macron's call for regulation, I would say it's you, you, a little bit like, we'll see what happens, right? But I think the thing that was very, very positive in that call was the focus on working together with different stakeholders and the, the sort of proactive engagement both with civil society and the industry to try to come to a place where it, the, the rules of the road are beneficial to everybody. You had a point? Yes, uh, just uh, you've actually <laughs> read oh, my mind. Um, just to emphasize um, on Macron's um, call and, and, and to ensure that uh, all stakeholders work together, as, as I've mentioned, where these, policies, these processes are closed though, things don't turn out to be good. I gave the example of January 2014 and June 2014 delay of the African Convention. And um, Kaja um, and Salila, thanks for emphasizing about uh, the Tech Accord and it's a good first step that um, all the 60 companies have taken. Uh, and, and just to uh, re-echo what I told, uh, I spoke with Kaja um, a, a few weeks ago, uh, trying to expand that take accord in those norms to other companies in other developing countries because there's a lot of startups uh, in other parts which maybe needs to adhere to these principles and to build more allies and for them to think to head in this direction of more action uh, and, and then also just to emphasize the Freedom Online Coalition, the 13 principles uh, which have been part of uh, the best working group on cyber security which f focus on, on human rights. Those 13 principles shouldn't just um, be uh, ignored like those who are, there's a lot of work put into those 13 principles which uh, we did and all the stakeholders, it was a very multi-stakeholder input with various governments, the 30 governments um, uh, we, over the last four years, so it's something, four or five years, we need to build onto that work. And then also um, the GFCE uh, and, 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 and the Tech Accord uh, webinars, that's a good, a good step. And just to, to um, maybe bring to, uh, to attention, there's a new expert group that is being developed by the African Union, Cybersecurity Expert Group, uh, that will officially be launched in December, maybe also about the capacity building work, maybe building onto more that of that work and that partnership that we are working on with the African Union and the rest of the stakeholders uh, back at home. Yeah. Marcus? My comment's very brief. I, I, I would suggest for us, I think it may be more important to focus on the call, for, on the Paris call, rather on a speech by a very senior politician, the president of the French Republic, that the Paris call for action has a real direct impact and is of relevance for us. And the reference to all the national uh, workshops and the national regional initiatives we have now by spreading the IGF model across the world is actually a very powerful model and there is one way of coming towards convergence of policies and that is bottom-up sharing of best practices which may actually be more efficient than just 
declaring something top down which may or may not be uh, respected thank you great so i think with that we'll go into the last round of questions and then i will i, I will inc i will ask our panelists to speak so do you do you have a question no do, are there other people in the room no so in that, uh, then maybe I will sort of ask to us all to go down the line before we sort of I'll summarize in these concluding remarks. So uh, just um, sorry. So just to close, um, we uh, just to close and to summarize uh, this. In, in just two points: multi-stakeholder, human rights friendly. So. That's the summary of, uh, of that I would give as a closing speech, that uh, these processes should still should continue being multi-stakeholder in places where they're not multi-stakeholder should uh, be opened up and should be human rights friendly and should be done in a very transparent manner uh, in compliance with the 13 principles of the FOC best uh, working group on, on cyber security and the, the best practices forum work that has been done over the several years on cyber security. Uh, that's what I would close with uh, this. And thanks for the opportunity, Kaja and uh, Marcus and everyone. Thank you. Uh, it's been nice uh, doing this journey with you guys. Thank you. Selena? Oh, oh, sorry. Forgive me. I think that uh, the important message here today is that multi-stakeholderism is the only way really to protect uh, peace and security in cyberspace and peace and security in the real world and threats to cybersecurity impact companies, they impact governments, they impact people. Um, when you think about things like Not Petya, when you think about things like WannaCry, those uh, attacks hurt a lot of people uh, that had nothing to do with traditional cybersecurity or fancy global norms. And so in order to make things work, in a way that is beneficial for the entire world in the future and also in the present. We need to make sure that uh, the Paris call, uh, that the Tech Accord and other similar initiatives bring all of these stakeholders at the table with government, with civil society, with NGOs, and with um, the common person so that we can join together to protect ourselves and to reap the benefits of information and make sure that it's not abused. Yeah, thank you. So in addition to that, um, I would say that the, this, this year's IGF, uh, BPF form, was I think very helpful in the sense of at, uh, approaching it from an international peace and security point of view uh, for these diplomats that sit in there that, you know, they're very familiar with the norms developed within the UN Enforced Committee, but now they see the norms, standards, and rules developed not only by governments within their field, but also by uh, non-state stakeholders and civil society and internet governance community. And I think that creates very good awareness for these you know, diplomats basically also of what is already out there. And I think especially also from our point of view, like the, G the Global Commission's point of view, is that is exactly what we should aim for is more coherency and not so much as like uh, conversions that you know, there's one line that is not something that I think we should be aiming for. But I think, and I applaud you with this document, I think it creates a very good four step you know, for, uh, from a different point of view from other communities, non-state. Thank you. Thank you, and, and I think, I, think I, I worry a little bit when we're always on agreement on the panel, but that's okay. Um, but um, I think the main points to, th to think about, I think from the discussion, and I think from the, the actual document that came out, um, is the, 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 there's clearly an appetite for multi-stakeholder work in cybersecurity. And I think there is, um, at the moment, a lack of it, I would say, in large parts around the world. I think that's why we all um, are sort of liked and I think supported a lot of those on the panel, the, the Paris call uh, that the French government organized. Um, the, the importance of, um, I think, balancing and separating, um, um, like Ephraim was saying, cybersecurity at the infrastructural level and peace and security level and content level, I think, cannot be under understated. Um, and um, the, 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 the sort of the, the conversations and the inputs that the, this group of people can sort of put into those 
dialogues, both in international level and on domestic levels, are critical. Um, I think we're not really sort of, I think we touched a little bit upon like whether the, um, the, the, this group should continue focusing on cybersecurity and particularly on norms in the, um, in the next uh, year or so. I think there is, um, the people on the panel, we all think that probably yes. Um, and that's a good opportune moment, both with the Paris call, drive for its implementation, but also with the discussions of the UN that are kick-starting for the civil society, that be, the, the best practice forum can provide an opportunity for the civil society to come together and provide opinions into those processes and try and push them in a particular direction. Um, but um, we, I feel that we didn't hear enough from necessarily from, uh, from, from the, the floor um, or indeed from online, I feel maybe we sort of ran out of time towards the end. But uh, we, uh, so we hope that you provide feedback um, and continue to provide feedback to us. But with that, I will ask Marcus to sort of highlight the processes. Yes, thank you very much. And like you, I had hoped for more feedback uh, from the floor and from participants in the room on the way forward. But, uh, it's not too late, I think, uh, and with that I would hand to Wim to ask us to give the details if we still want to make contribution. You are now in the, have the difficult task of finalizing the document as the final output of this best practice forum. And then we have now a new mag in place and in January there will be a meeting and I also had a message from my co-facilitator from Ben who said he is looking forward to uh, taking this discussion to back to the MAG and uh, hope for a renewal of the mandate of this best practice forum. As I said earlier, it's done from year to year and it obviously would be more conducive to long-term work if we could establish a work plan. But I think we have a very powerful agenda item on the table and that is the Paris call. And I think the IGF cannot afford to ignore this Paris call. And we in one way or another have to uh, deal with it. But Wim, what are the options, what are the possibilities uh, people have? Thank you, Marcus. Um, like I said, the document is still um, up in draft format at this moment. Um, the idea is to finalize it be between now and the end of the year. Uh, what means that there is a very short window um, to give additional input. Um, Apart from, like I said at the beginning, uh, we do our much our best to uh, include points raised at uh, this meeting and at the discussion, to include that in the in the document. Uh, but either via the, if you f you will find the links on the website where there is a review platform where you can submit um, comments on the document, or uh, might even be. Um, the better way, if you subscribe to the mailing list, to the BPF mailing list, and submit your comments via the mailing list, that might be a better option because then immediately, as you will be subscribed, you will be informed on the plans, on future plans for the BPF. Um, and then, like I said, the output is will be published before the end of the year. The idea of the BPF is also that it is not a document to be archived, reflecting what has happened here. The initial idea of, idea of BPF is to collect best practices, ideas, and that they are actively used and feed into policy discussions elsewhere. Uh, and I think Katja may be refer to a lot of uh, a number of discussions that are planned for the coming years where the document should be useful. So also, please um, look at the document like that and use it in uh, that way. Thank you. Thank you, Wim. And with that, I thank my co-moderator has done an excellent job and all the panelists have also done an equally excellent job and thank you all for participating and with that I think we can conclude this year's session of the best practice forum on cybersecurity. Thank you.